Schalke are bad. For all my life, I thought of them as a decent Bundesliga side, especially when I first paid attention to the league in the early 2010s. A center back pairing of Joel Matip and Benedek Huvedes, Jefferson Farfan on the wing, Klaasian Hundelar up front, and they even had Raul when they last won a trophy. Don't get me started on their world-class talents who definitely lived up to their potential. Fast forward to 2018, where they finished in second with Domenico Tedesco. Yeah, they lost a lot of players for free over the years and spent money in questionable ways and spent money in questionable ways, leading to a lot of debt. Okay, got bad. Seven coaches in four years, bad. Three wins in a Bundesliga season, bad. Get promoted and sent back down, bad. Be expected to earn promotion again and be in 16 during the November international break type of bad. In summary, Carl Herrards was sacked and Schalke would be looking for an eighth coach since Tedesco. But have they finally found the right man? Welcome to the club, Joachim Kruv. Joachim is a fitness guru who loves himself a sniff. Nevertheless, after meeting the coaching staff that remained, he found out two of them loved fitness just as much as him. You might think you lift, but do you even? Which means he needed to focus on other areas. On the topic of staff members, most seem eager to get the hell out before we could introduce ourselves. Despite a dire situation, Schalke are considered the best team in the division via the season preview and indeed do have a strong squad. Several strikers are physical and great in the air, including captain Simon Terode. The midfield is a mixed bag as there are several decent players such as Ron Schallenberg, Paul Zeguin, and Lino Templeman. Yet outside of work rate, they don't stand out. Defensively, Cedric Bruna is the only defensive fullback with decent defending, so we'll either use Marcin Kaminski or Henning Matriciani as the inverted fullback on the left. In that, Muller was chosen as the number one over old man Ralf Fehrmann. Now the formation, we're using what I call the bench press. It's a 4 triple 2 slim edition. Schalke really lacks attacking midfielders, so for our first match versus Osnabrück, I gave my full faith to Hassan Widraogo. The lad has played for the club since he was 8, and his debut was less than memorable. We responded with Brunet's brilliant cross to Terode, but there seemed to be no managerial bump. The boys have to get used to a new system, but allowing this much space was unacceptable. A loss wasn't a friendly welcome, so I needed to go over some things with my assistant manager before our home debut. However, in all the training sessions, he was never there. Looking into it, the guy has a second job. Hey, get back! We also didn't have a regular coach until I called this guy up from the under-19s, and the players' morale collapsed before we got into the next fixture. The lineup remained unchanged versus Elversburg, as I wore shorts and a t-shirt in December. A nice thing with our system is that it gets numbers in the box. The front four are relatively tall, so accurate crosses should lead to goals. That occurred today, which includes Widraogo's first ever goal. Two was enough for my first victory as manager. It's been over a month since Schalke won, so it's awesome to have that feeling back. And it continued for the remaining Hinrunde. Brunet's strike at Karlsruhe and a victory versus third place Nuremberg ended the calendar year with three victories in a row. What I love about Germany, other than the Bratwurst, is that December and January have a long winter break, where your team can rejuvenate for the remainder of the season, which is called the Rugrunde. Trillion dollars. And now the mark- Oh! Oh! It went to zero! Schalke are supposedly in a lot of debt, and with no transfer budget, I had to look at the finances. We were in the red, but 100 million less than I expected. It turns out we went to administration with some dude named Stefan Amen. Not sure what the no takeover type with two exclamation marks mean, but in a matter of a month, the administrator caused her balance to shrink from negative 157 million to minus 17. The administrator left in September, bringing in Marcel Schumacher. I'm suspicious how they saved the club, but I'm not complaining. We still didn't have a single cent to spend on transfers, but I know a player from Nigeria available for free. Oh, RB Leipzig got him already. Well, we did get Emmanuel Michael. With a really good physical, sublime tackling, and insane crossing, we just have to wait until the summer. Schalke are known for their youth academy, and with Drexler being a more fraudulent Drexler, I called up Tristan Osmani to play in the first 11. However, the team was on the brink of losing against Fortuna Dusseldorf. A week prior, we drew our affiliate Allen 1-1, which didn't help our confidence. Despite that being a friendly, 
the performance translated to Dusseldorf. Thankfully, we got really lucky in the 90th minute with Zimmermann kicking the ball into his own goal. Heading to a big match of former German giants, Hamburg got us to finally use Baumgartel, who was out with a concussion. Maybe we didn't do enough checks on him, as he pulled off an audacious back heel to Brunner, who found another man making his first appearance. Kenan Karaman, who not just scored, but assisted one to the Poldergust for a 2-0 victory. The Turk continued to cook assisting two versus Braunschweig, which went along with a Terode brace. The good times weren't gonna last forever, unfortunately. With two draws in a row in fixtures, I thought we were better in. Still, no losses in a while. But on a random Sunday, 17 players were unhappy with me, with Terode leading the charge. They are not happy with your manager of the team and they wish to talk to you about it. Some of your players said that you lost to Dresden and no longer have enough support to stay at the club. What? I've lost one game at the club. I had to promise them that I was working hard to improve things. The squad also have next to no faith in me and the managerial support was abysmal. I'm so confused. And wouldn't it make sense that we defeated first place Zhang Pauli 4-1 away from home? They did get a red card, but we were winning at that point which saw Osmani score his first goal. At the end of the day though, that meeting with the players made me realize why Schalke are the way they are. There are guys who don't work hard until the final whistle, make lazy passes, don't close down the opponents quick enough, and are only here for a paycheck. A draw to Rostock because of a 95th minute OG, and our first loss after 10 undefeated was annoying with how it happened. We play nice possession football and create more chances than most, which lead to wins we're supposed to get. On the negative, some of the goals we concede leave me speechless. And if we look at the XG table, which tells us how many expected goals scored and conceded we should have, I sense a problem. This can be best described against Hertha Berlin. They've been awful and we were looking comfortable for a win. We Draogo scored the opener, but the side couldn't find a second. Fast forward to the 90th minute and Baumgartel is on the ball. However. He overthinks things and gives it away. Out of position, Hertha finds two passes and equalizes. Then, in the 97th minute, a throw in leads to a couple more passes, and Baumgartel leaves Dujak to press the ball carrier, but he leaves an open lane to the man he was marking. Hertha score a dramatic winner, stunning us and ruling out promotion. We did have a chance as at one point we were six points within third. Unfortunately, these inconsistent results mentioned and other ones to come ruled that out. Looking at the positives, we gave certain players a chance, including two teenage camps and a young striker named Top towards the end of the campaign. There were other impressive performances, like from Byron Lana, who scored seven and assisted six in the Rook Runda, finishing with the second highest average rating in the league. Unfortunately, there are more negatives. First, I apparently broke Tarode's promise, so he's not happy. Secondly, our keeper Muller lost his place towards the end of the season because he became unhappy over not being given a new contract. Bro, read the room and the finances. Also, I sent the Poltergust and Drexler to Schalke's second team, which is a fourth division side. I only did that because they had the audacity to complain about singling them out for their poor training. I'm not asking for much, just don't train worse than Ralph Fehrman. Finally, there were several who I gave chances to or brought up who ended up breaking some sort of bone in their body they would be released. At the end of the day, finishing 8th isn't the worst with how we arrived. Hanover and St. Pauli will be back in the top division, while Darmstadt and Union Berlin come down. Alright, let's have a closer look at the Bundesliga. Avikov Nachi is second top scorer? Harry Kane only at 14? Leipzig won the league? What about the DFB Pokal? Arby Leipzig beat Bayern? Okay, Bayern must have done well in the Champions League. Oh, eliminated in the round of 16 of the Europa League to West Ham. If you're wondering what skin I'm using for the attributes, it's called OPZ Elite. I just downloaded it from FM Scout, it came with three, and I use OPZ Elite 2023. For face and logo packs, I got mine from Sorted Out SI. In order to get Schalke back to the Bundesliga and return to their former glory, what glory? Of uh, being a competent club, we needed to sign Danny Welbeck. Are you still that guy? Am I still that guy? He ain't that guy anymore because on trial, he saw the club state for two seconds and decided to retire. So we brought him in as U19's manager. All right, what about someone like Burak Yilmaz? That man is a proven champion. Surely he could do numbers for us. He long retired, but he arrived as my new assistant manager. What happened to the other guy? Well, we realized he was bad at his jobs, leading to him wanting to be the head performance analyst and get twice the wages? 
What are you doing? There were a lot of new staff members in. And here's a tip. If you want good coaches long term, but can't afford great ones yet, go for some that are slightly worse, but don't have the Continental Pro license and send them on a coaching course. Passing these improves their attributes just as long as their coaching potential hasn't been reached already. I still wanted a veteran forward to tutor my promising attackers. We found it in the 2012 FIFA Pro Men's 11, Radamel Falcao. One of the best strikers in his era, he may be past it, but he still got the ability to put it into the back of the net. He scored zero. Not even an assist. Regardless, with a summer of drama and needing to get rid of players who were irreverent to the club, all these sales gave us... With that added to the initial transfer and wage budget, we found some great deals. The most expensive was Clemens Riedel, who looks like a promising German center back, costing 2.3 million. He was terrible on his debut versus Greuther Fourth. Opening day partnered him up with Leo Greimel, who came off a brutal injury. The Austrian was alright, but Riedel looked silly on both of these that we conceded. Because of that, we drew two all, and were forced to play Baumgartel. Why forced? I didn't really want to keep him since he stated his intentions to leave at the end of his contract. However, he is the best defender at the club and he proved that with a clean sheet versus Hamburg. That was their only opportunity, but goals remained difficult to achieve until an Aussie stepped onto the pitch. Nestori Irankunda. Wait, he's representing Tanzania? The man literally lived there for three months. I thought you were my brother! <laughs> Regardless, I couldn't care less about his allegiances, as he got the win. It was a tough schedule to start though, as Union Berlin away was on match day three, which saw our new keeper dinked. Kuhn Castiles, who arrived on a free. Why a guy who had a season like this with Wolfsburg decided to drop down a level is beyond me. While it hadn't been a smooth start, his teammates would support him. We Draogo with a far post header to equalize, and Keke Top left wide open to find the winner. That was assisted by Victor Aletu, who joined on loan from AC Milan. A satisfying win. Not for the three points, but mostly due to Union signing Justin Janicek instead of us. The former Bayern Academy player would only make two appearances for them. Yes. See your mistake. Speaking of former Bayern players, we did technically sign three. Johannes Schenk, in the hopes that he would be our future number one keeper. Oh, jeezy pips, man. Along with him was South Korean Lee Hyunju, who seemed great for 600k. The final one didn't directly transfer from Bayern, but he did come from our next opponents. Why do they use these five letters to represent this word? Anyways, the club is Unterhaking, who miraculously defeated Paderborn in the promotion playoff. They then allowed Maurice Kratenbacher to leave for 425k. Without their star man in the second tier, they would have a rough campaign, conceding 95 goals and finishing with 15 points, three above the record of the lowest amount. Rubbing more salt in the wound, Kratenbacher would score on them. Oh. Things were set in motion as the back line began to perform outstandingly. Nothing conceded in six straight encounters, and when the defense let up, Castiles stepped in to make some massive one-on-one -on -one saves. Eight consecutive clean sheets would be the record, but we didn't reach it. Magdeburg were nearly relegated last season and seemed destined for it this time. Brian Lama scored from a swift counter-attack, but our opponents wouldn't stand down. They found the Baldu Conde, who must own this piece of the field and charge exorbitantly high rent as nobody was near him to stop his banger. To be fair, we were poor and only deserved a draw. 11 games in, and we were in first place, and had a second round matchup in the DFB Pokal versus Mainz. Mainz have been a respectable Bundesliga side for 15 plus years. They've had the highs of reaching the division with future Schalke rival Jurgen Klopp. They had a fun team in the early 2010s with Thomas Tuchel in charge. Also a former employee of a Schalke rival. And now their most recent manager, Bo Svensson. We were a division below them, but a little bit of luck gave us a rather quick lead. I may have underestimated my own squad. Our right back Runa put in a brilliant cross, fighting Kratenmacher for the second. The Belgian had an incredible run of assists in the beginning of the season, and while the teams began to adapt, his danger was always present. Mines wasn't completely useless. Okay, they were until after the penalty, but Castiles was up for this match, keeping them out and securing a 3-0 dub. The momentum carried over with three more wins, including third place Darmstadt. 
One of these wins also had us 5-0 up on Kaiser Slaughter, which had Emmanuel Michael make his debut. Our sole signing last season, who did not arrive until now, did this, and then whatever this was. He was loaned in January to Valenciennes, where he wouldn't play any games. Match day 15 arrived, and no losses on the board, but Regensburg would be where this all ended. We were ahead 2-1 with 30 minutes remaining, but Bumgarner pulled on Hoop's shirt for a penalty. All squared, and we continued to cause problems for ourselves, with the story losing the ball in a dangerous area, leading to a counter. That resulted in Konrad Faber scoring just like that. It was the winner, adding a number to the L column. A few more wins were earned by the end of the Hinrunda, including a clutch free kick by Osmani, who was having a fantastic campaign. That was against Fortuna Dusseldorf, placing us 10 points above. We've been dominant, but we're lacking in one area. Strikers. You do not score until you score. KK Top was doing fine with seven goals, but he was outdone by Asan Widraogo, who I would call the Gelsenkirchen Jude Bellingham. And there's a reason he's here, not Madrid. With a couple other freeloaders sold and the Schalke board giving us an increased transfer budget, I could finally bring in another tree. Lorenzo Luca for 3.8 million. Nine centimeters taller than Keke Top. At over 2 meters, the Italian is a dream for this system, especially when I changed the pressing forward to deep lying. This occurred with the story being loaned to Real Zaragoza. It was kind of my fault. I stupidly promised him that our defense would get stronger, but we didn't bring anyone better than the current two starters. Yeah, I did buy Tobias Slotzeger after he left, but the damage was done. Before Lucas' dominance could begin, we had RB Leipzig in the DFB Pokal third round. A little unfair, I gotta say but we got to face one of two men who inspired Joaquin Cruz's tactic. Marco Rosa, whose Leipzig played the 4 triple 2 Red Bull edition. So, whose tin can is better? Clearly Leipzig, they're reigning Bundesliga winners. They also have Amos Opayemi, who's taking Germany by storm, finishing with 10 goals and 4 assists as a 19 year old. We were lucky we had Castiles to keep this matchup close, but Baumgartel, who by the way, agreed a future deal with Stuttgart, decided to attempt a shot into his own net. But Castiles was so good that he stopped it, but he had no chance on Timo Werner's rebound. Our run ended, and we had some tricky matches straight after. Hamburg haven't been in the top flight since 2018, which probably saw the wildest end of season pictures I've ever seen. Their promotion hopes would be made difficult with another loss to us, thanks to Osmani clutching up again. Unfortunately, Reuter Furth were the cockroaches of the league with a 92nd minute equalizer. I guess that happens when you stop playing Baumgartel. But we'll survive with one last tight victory. At home to Union Berlin, we couldn't find the net to save our lives. But in added time, the tree Lorenzo Luca was grabbed, and we earned a 92nd minute penalty, which he slotted. This was where his domination began. It continued with the awful Unterhaking, who did prevent him from scoring, but helped Osmani and Lee get on the stat sheet. Adding Widraogo to the group made things scary for Karlsruhe. With his 10th, he followed that up with a pass to Luca. Unfortunately, injuries would sideline the young German for the remainder of the season. But Schalke's dominance continued as Karlsruhe went down 5-0, which included a second from the Italian. But it would be the last game Castiles played, with injuries rocking his boat as well. Still had the most clean sheets in the league. Soon to be relegated Braunschweig were unfortunately part of Luca's game, as he continued to up his tally by scoring a hat-trick. Many asked what he couldn't do. Score against Nuremberg. But a win thanks to Top and Osmani. However, he decided to up his bet and stated he would score four versus Duisburg. And you know what? He did so in one half. He was chasing down a top score in just seven games. And while Hertha stopped him, handing us our second loss of the campaign, that was a mere pebble in the way of Lorenzo. Magdeburg wouldn't be lucky, as the Italian gave them nightmares with five from him alone. A 7-0 thrashing confirmed promotion for the Royal Blues, but the shield was in our sights. Kaiser Slartin could try, but stopping our tall strikers was not going to happen, with Top grabbing a brace and of course, Luka scoring two. The title was ours, and in the three-point era, we ended with the most points in Bundesliga 2 history with 85. Nothing was slowing this train seeing Luka and Top finishing on top 
of the gold charts with 19. Several impressed, with Osmani, Buna, and a couple young prospects dominating the average ratings. Osmani too finished on top with assists, while Luca found 8 of his own. 27 goal contributions in half a season is insane, and so is Hamburg missing out on the promotion playoff by a single point, because we conceded this to Dusseldorf in the 90th minute. Now with Schalke back in the Bundesliga, who will sink and who will swim? I can't swim. There is a little over 8 million to spend, but a huge increase in my wage budget. Until I received a reality check and saw everyone's earnings increase significantly. Trying to keep everyone capped at 50k per week was difficult, causing me to pass on certain targets. With Baumgartel gone, Greimel needed a partner to avoid getting the shaft defensively. That brought in Moritz Jens for around 9 million. It was a lot of our budget, even with the sale of Ibrahim Cisse. Several were loaned out, including a few of our attackers, and Falcao retiring. Hola. Soy Promising names arrived, such as U17 World Cup winner Max Morstet and the slightly shorter Nelson Whiteber. Tim Goller came in as well to potentially be our future number one keeper. Speaking of that, our first Bundesliga fixture was fast approaching, but Castiles decided to consider his options at the end of his contract. Right after, I offered him a new one. That led to Sevilla agreeing a deal with us, bringing in significant profit on a free transfer. We said off Wiedersehen, and we're near the completion of Dennis Seyman's move from Stuttgart. What do you mean we don't have enough funds? Ah no, I forgot about the transfer revenue! I delayed this transfer for weeks, hoping I could make it work, but Stuttgart grew tired, and our board wasn't willing to budge. Thankfully, Lorenzo Montipo wasn't a bad plan B. Schalke's first Bundesliga match in over 800 days had some bumps along the way, which also included Keke Top's injury. But the issue initially looked like our back line. However, Montipo was ready to make a big save on his debut. While I was wondering why Udoje was on loan at Frankfurt, they had a throw in on the other side, where Grimal did brilliant work to prevent Mario Goza from scoring on his weak foot. We responded swiftly with Nelson hitting the post. Prior to halftime, Lorenzo Luca does what he does best and causes a nuisance for defenders, winning a penalty. Surprisingly, Wiper took the ball from him and scored our first goal. That's how it ended, handing our first point against the future Conference League finalists. It was a mixed start to the season, with mid-table expected, but at home to Köln, we made things difficult for ourselves and wasted crucial chances. Then much later on, out of nothing, Montipo let in Lacou's strike from distance and we missed another chance to eventually lose. A win was still missing, but we got lucky that our next opponent, Stuttgart, decided to play Bumgardel. He was ecstatic about the reunion, and so was I, but for different reasons. A dominant performance with three goals from Viper, Uidraogo, and Osmani, two of which were assisted by last season's signing, Filip Rejcik. The Polish wonder kid from Legia Warszaw arrived for 2.6 million and earned himself a starting spot with Aletu gone. However, our squad depth was a problem. A handful of players brought it up, leading to two loans. Marco Stamenik from Manchester City and Chelsea's Cole Palmer to hopefully fix the issue. What do you mean you're pissed, Ron Schallenberg? I fixed the pro- Left back? Since when do you ever mention left back? I don't know the, the name, but uh, the main Sassinile. Funnily enough, Ron, I have a solution. For the most part, matches in the early going were tight. Several 1-0s, including a loss to Mainz, who weren't as fraudulent this time, Palmer's debut goal versus Wolfsburg for a win, and adding another with Anton Stock deflecting Matriciani's strike. Scoring was a glaring issue though, specifically Luca, who hadn't gotten one. Was he just a second division merchant? The 4 triple 2 narrow derby with RB Leipzig was next, and we were in store for a great match. Wait, Montipo got injured by cutting his hand? Was he not wearing his gloves? Hold on. Wasn't he volunteering at the Italian deli last night? You cut your hand while shaving some prosciutto, weren't you? He still started. In this much anticipated encounter, Leipzig initially took us lightly, as Stayskull made a horrendous pass to the returning top, who immediately found Luca for the opener. Welcome back, Lorenzo. Not you, Keke. Immediately after winning the ball from kickoff, Lorenzo nearly got an instant brace. Sadly, that woke up Leipzig, as Brunner gives the ball cheaply, leading to Amos finding Werner, who then connects to a sprinting Openda. The momentum was with them, 
as Omo launch Werner into action. As he rolls it in, oh, and Timo Werner has fluffed his lines. Yet we kept the majority of the possession, which might have been our opponent's plan. Lunar loses the ball to Amos, and pretty quickly, he finds Werner, leaving our keeper in no man's land. Even Timo wasn't missing that. Now, why do I have my sweeper keeper on attack? I don't know. Regardless, a retort was needed in the second half, and we draw Ogo would aid in that, finding Osmani in behind for the equalizer. Boom! Yes! Why stop there though? Who mistake? Viper? We draw Ogo? Let's go! A win was on the cards, but mistakes was the name of the game, as Matriciani clearly made the wrong decision, and Leipzig capitalized with Sheshko's equalizer. A Bundesliga classic, or Sheshko, both work in my eyes. Now, unfortunately, Marco Rosa would leave for Tottenham, making our rivalry with Leipzig boring, as Stefan Kuntz uses a 4-2-3-1. Although, we did defeat them later on in the campaign, thanks to Lorenzo Luca Brace. On going through the rest of the Hinrunda, draws fall with Heidenheim, and surprisingly, Bayern Munich. They've been iffy, making no transfers, knocked out of the Champions League outright, and Tuchel claiming their aim is continental football. What a great life! Getting paid more, and doing your job worse! We're beginning to earn more victories with 3 and 5. One included Lee grabbing a brace late, and then eventually getting injured. Then injured again, which does not include the injuries from earlier. Also, Luka grabbed a hat-trick versus Fortuna Dusseldorf. Through 14 match days, Köln and Dortmund look like the clear front runners for the league. That was until the first Revier derby. Dortmund are Schalke's biggest rivals, with both clubs from the Ruhr region in Germany. The first fixture played between the two was a win by Schalke on May 3rd, 1925. 100 years, 7 months, and 3 days later, the two would finally face off. Who'd score the first goal? Well, what about the local boy, Widraogo? Dortmund were not fully fit, as they had an intense 1-1 draw with Köln a few days prior. It was showing, as they didn't seem focused, while we were dialed in. Luka made it 2 only 20 minutes in, taunting the away fans and bringing joy to the Royal Blues. Dortmund continued to stink it up, and a little before the half, top. Oh, the ball! Luka! 3-0! 3-0! 3-0 versus Dortmund! Despite Malin scoring right after, nothing occurred in the remaining 45 as we got the bragging rights and were in 5th place. Two successive victories followed in the Hinrunda, including a dominant performance versus Gladbach, moving us into 4th, which was insane. Although, I'm perplexed on Cohn on how they're still in 1st place. Our incredible job led to a new contract, which was nice, before losing to Cohn. Looking into them, I'm surprised how well some of their players were doing, such as Linton Mina and Mark Tillman. But a big factor had to be their back line. Could they keep it up? It's not my problem. The start to the Rookrunda was rough, which included a loss to Frankfurt, another to Wolfsburg, and drawing Stuttgart. The only win was versus Mainz, and that's thanks to 20-year-old Taylan Bulut, who came out of nowhere to find a brace in the last 10 minutes. Did I mention that he's a right back? As Brunera ages, he will play more. A painful moment was being eliminated in the DFB Pokal third round to the cockroaches of Greuther Fourth. Still haven't beaten them in my time in charge. The underwhelming form fixed itself up with three victories in a row, including that Leipzig triumph. 25 matches were played by the beginning of March, seeing us remain in fourth. But it seemed like Bayern began a resurgence, and Köln fell back to earth. The January transfer window was the Bavarian's turning point, with Saudi Arabia signing Leroy Sané for almost 200 million? Are you kidding me? On deadline day, they bought Savio, eh, Jesper Lindstrom for at least 72 million, he's alright, my youth academy player for some reason, and Benjamin Sheshko, where he barely played because, of course, every Kane is still here. Did I have a chance at Munich? Well, my game plan was going fine, till Brunner just gave the ball for the opener. It stayed 1-0 for a while, but Musiala pulled off an insane pass to hand us a 2-0 L. European football was possible with 8 games left. However, these fixtures needed some help from new sources. 2-2 at home to Bochum in the final 10 minutes, where we blew a 2-0 lead. But Wutek would help us out by getting sent off. A man advantage with so many top players in the box, Brunet would find Max Murstedt for the winner. He and Viper earned more time due to injuries elsewhere, which saw a Max Brace versus Darmstadt, and a goal from him and Viper in a 2-1 away win at Dusseldorf. Unfortunately, Luka's goal wasn't enough against Freiburg in the 
sole loss of this section. Big love to Lorenzo though, who was our top scorer this season with 16, only one less than Harry Kane. The table still had us in fourth, but only up on goal difference over two other clubs, and Leipzig were surging as well. Continental qualification was likely until this happened against Leverkusen. We just started the match. We Raogo seeing red was a shame after his fantastic season. Seven goals and nine assists saw him develop further, but will we be able to keep him long term? Despite being down to 10 men, a miracle occurred as Raychik's out of nowhere free kick made it 1 0. Could we defend for 90 minutes? No, no, we couldn't. Leverkusen had a lot of turmoil in this adventure, sacking three managers, with Marcelino being the latest appointment. I think this moment summed their situation pretty well. Somehow, we were 2-1 up and actually defended impressively for the longest time. However, in the 84th minute, Wodarczyk found an equalizer. A minute later, Boniface would do the same as we collapsed. It's not like we'd be able to do anything, even if Leverkusen allowed us a free kick and to win a header and to score off another to equalize in the 90th minute. Wait, we equalized? A point somehow earned, but it dropped us down to fifth, and without Widraogo in the ill-placed Riviera Derby, we were absolutely demolished by Dortmund. Augsburg were defeated on the penultimate match day thanks to the returning youngster, which put us in a tricky situation. The last game of the season was away at Borussia Mönchengladbach. We could no longer finish in fourth and potentially drop all the way down to seventh. I would be fine with Conference League football, which is seventh, but if Werder Bremen defeat RB Leipzig in the DFB Pokal final, that would no longer be a European place. We lost to Gladbach 1-0, which meant that was our position. Nevertheless, a successful season as a newly promoted side, with a lot of room to grow. Although, that meant we regrettably had to cheer for Leipzig in the cup final. And they thankfully won with these two bozos missing a header in the 93rd minute. Let's go, Comfort League! If you want to support me as a content creator, I do have a Patreon. I'll mention more details at the end. We did more than enough with Schalke in our first Bundesliga campaign by qualifying for Europe. So who better to sign than Thomas Müller? Hello, Thomas Müller live from the UEFA Award. Introducing himself, in my case, at the 2010 World Cup, he went on and won the Golden Boot. By the end of the next tournament, not only was he a world champion, but he had a real chance to eventually become the top scorer in World Cup history. <laughs> While internationally things weren't going amazingly, Club-wise, Müller was a crucial part in Bayern's decade-long dominance in Germany, adding two Champions Leagues too. Unfortunately, age arrives at everyone's doorstep, seeing him slow down statistically and end up at Schalke. Nevertheless, with a few other additions, including Alexander Chernikov for 10.5 million, plus Sergio Carrera replacing Brunet for less than 5, what will this season entail? 150 to 1. That was our odds for the Bundesliga. Six games later, we showed why those numbers can't win the league. It was rough losing all our away fixtures and being embarrassed at home to RB Leipzig. Second season syndrome, tactics exposed, or was it me who was a true con artist? My excuse was fixture congestion, since we had six Europa Conference League matches along with two qualifiers to get into the tournament. Realistically, we could rotate a bunch and still be fine, just not against FC Michelin, apparently. Anyways, big thanks to several of my attackers who made this part easier, which leads to the next problem. All my strikers got injured. KK top securing a victory versus Frankfurt. Here's a broken foot, sir. In the very next game against Heidenheim, we won 3-0 with a goal from Nelson Wiper. Out for a month. At least Lorenzo Luca was drinking its milk. Damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it. There were a few fixtures without injuries, seeing a Hoffenheim draw and defeating Bochum. Mamma mia! Let me introduce you to our new future one keeper, Tim Goler. He also got injured. In addition, he barely developed and is worse in big matches than Shank, who left in January for Monaco. That's why you shouldn't be surprised to see the knockoff Raquel May grab a brace in our loss to Gladbach. Thankfully, I still had Max Moorstedt, who already had an injury and would get more later in the campaign. The lack of consistency in the front line was bothersome, despite wins versus Nuremberg and Wolfsburg. Yet, we were roughly in our expected position. But if you looked at the top, there's a second one now? Well, you'd realize Dortmund are sh**. I don't know what they're cooking at Signal Aduna Park, but it's worse than my jambalaya where I mixed up two teaspoons of paprika with chili flakes. 
I was having a spicy time. At least mine had some flavor, because this Dortmund team is just lame. Playing Sula at right back with mediocre center halves, the midfield was all right to mid depending on fitness, and the attack hasn't evolved from four years ago. Adeyemi's pacey as ever, Mukoko's kind of average, and they still have Daniel Malin. Beba Bay haven't finished above third since that 2023 collapse. Terzis remains in charge, but the magic Dortmund used to have in my eyes is long gone. Who cares about that though? Schalke have suffered for years. Oh, we are no longer the second best in Germany. Well, you better cry about not being the best in the Ruhr region because we smoked their asses 3 to nil. They didn't show up. While Nelson Wiper was a major player with a goal and assist. Probably the high of the season so far, which means we won't score in December. Listen, listen, I get it. Pot down, bruv. Allowing Fringpong to get up from the ground to lose to Leverkusen, a home draw to Freiburg, and losing to Bayern after subbing on Musiala. When I realized I should have type marked him, I was already dead. A young 19 year old named Vladimir Kovacevic played and didn't do well. But there was a lot riding on this guy who we signed for a mere 500k. He got homesick and wanted to see his family for Christmas. Ninth place was worse than I anticipated, and with little budget to really improve things, we signed S. Mane. Best football player in the world. Sekuba for 325k. I forgot to register him. On deadline day, I loaned in Pablo Torre to rotate with the cams and Rocco Scone in case Rejcik got injured. I realized they were needed when we drew Augsburg and Bremen while losing to Leipzig again. Plus, Frankfurt eliminated us from the DFB Pokal after extra time. Oh, big mistake! <gasps> Cone, however, was interesting. Once again, they were competing for the title, but had a new man in charge, Julian Nagelsmann. Except no, it wasn't. Sergio Conceição got the job. How did the media completely miss? Regardless, after a long managerial merry-go-round, Cone's now former man Stefan Baumgart headed to Villa Park. Good move, as the villains got to the Europa League final. Conceição, on the other hand, had Bundesliga experience with Wolfsburg, before ditching them in 8 months for Bologna. He was only in Italy for 13 months. I'll do it. But I'll probably hate myself in the morning. Regardless, they were on top at Christmas for a consecutive year, yet a 5th minute Luca goal put pressure on them. Thomas Müller began playing higher up on the pitch, and in the 20th minute, the old man showed why. A great opening 45, although Raychek losing the ball in the midfield led to a counterattack, seeing Maina cut the lead in half. With a little over 20 to go, I decided to be more conservative, which backfired immediately. Cone hit the post, but Jens decided to not clear the ball, so Zelka just puts it in the net. <laughs> stupid, stupid, stupid. In Cohen's confused state, Schellenberg puts in a great ball for Moorset as he slots in the winner. Could Cohen overcome this? I know Sergio Conceição wouldn't, since the guy left less than two months later to 14th place Udinese. With one first place team knocked off their pedestal, how about another with Stuttgart? They have some respectable players, and the keeper who got away. Their X Factor is Chris Hure, who ended the campaign with 19 goals and 9 assists. Hmm, where did he come from? Wow! Man played for Schalke from age 8 to 15 and went to dormant. Oh, this got personal. Even though I played you last season, he had a crap match and we were keeping tight with our opponents, which became frustrating due to the chances we were missing. Then, before the final whistle, we had an opportunity. Bulut would find top at the back post. Returning from a broken foot, tears swelled down my eyes celebrating a massive victory. Schalke were beginning to get closer to the European spots. Yes, we drew Frankfurt right after, but Hoffenheim were demolished 5-1 with 4 from Nelson Wiper. Injuries hurt our output in the Hinrunda, but it was starting to fire up with our chase for not only the Europa League, but our ambition to win the conference. In the great year of 2027, Schalke were in the round of 16 of the Conference League. 30 years prior was their only taste of European glory. The formerly named UEFA Cup saw them face Inter in a two-legged final, resulting in the Royal Blues winning on penalties. Wouldn't it be great to experience something similar nowadays? The last 16 was going to be simple, with Apoel Bayer Sheva drawn. Indeed, they did draw us. Thankfully at home, Pop and Wiper got the job done with 3 in 47 minutes. However, Bayer Sheva didn't let us rest easy with two late goals, 
nearly extending the encounter. When you get to the quarters of any European competition, they also draw the route to the semi-final. With these other seven teams left, the favorites would likely be Lille, Everton, and Lazio. Although, I would love to face Rayo Vallecano and talk about this book. Instead, we were given Lazio. A tough draw, but worst of all, if we overcome Syria's second best team, we would likely face Everton. But we beat you. Not only on Michelin, but Premier League club plus Europa Conference League equals final four times out of five. On the way to Lazio, Nelson Wiper was on fire. Wiper, Wiper, boom, yes! A sole goal versus Gladbach and a hat trick versus Nuremberg brought all the plaudits to him. Unfortunately, he couldn't do much in a draw to Wolfsburg, since he was resting for Lazio. Lazio had several familiar names, including Zakani and Felipe Anderson on the wings, Lazio Gnoli in defense, the goal-scoring keeper in Povedel, plus Ciro Immobile on his last legs. Their starting midfield was quite scary, with Renato Sanch not caring that he played for Roma. They also had Matteo Guendouzi, along with Nico Rovella, who makes both my midfielders look average. Despite that, we were holding our own against Andoni Iraola's men. Huidrago hit the woodwork, and Wiper was blocked at the last second to keep his level at half. With Chiro the hero injured, Latsu began finding opportunities. So subs were made, and Huidrago began to cook. Oh, oh. Oh. However, we weren't stopping, and substitute Pablo Torre was given the chance for the lead. Bro. Before I could find words for that insane miss, Lazio went down and won a penalty with Bulut's mistake. An 87th minute pen gave them the advantage for the second leg, handing our first loss in 12 fixtures. Regardless, we had to get that off our minds with the Riviere derby. Dorman moved to 11, and Terzic was sacked weeks after the previous encounter. The Zerbi replaced him, but it wouldn't make much of a difference. We put three past them again with a top brace. Kovacevic earned himself two assists. Dortmund got closer, grabbing two themselves, but they lost the derby at home for the first time since 2019. Lazio also got a massive win, so both clubs were feeling good for the second leg. Each had one big chance missed, but in the 32nd minute, Guidraogo would equalize the aggregate. It remained that way at the half, but Lazio seemed nervous from the restart. Give it away right away to us. Very, uh... Nervy from Lazio there. Widraogo on it, finds Carrera, who's been a big game player right here. Yes! Let's go! Our defense remained solidified, and we would find a third late, advancing into the semi-finals. The Bundesliga form continued to sparkle, with a huge victory over Leverkusen, plus a tight 1-0 win over Freiburg that got nervy at the end. Two fixtures remained, and at least two more in the Conference League. Everton have been on the rise, and with some smart financial decisions, they created a competent team. Their backline was familiar, with Patterson looking fantastic, their double pivot were decent with James Garner and Oliver Skip, along with Calvert-Lewin at striker. The attacking midfield spots showcased their improvement. Luca Romero, Tete, Kamada, and Brian Taragotha were all respectable. It was Schalke's first European semi-final since 2011, and with the initial home tie, it was our boy, Widraogo, who made the initial impact. Going for a header, he was fouled, handing us a penalty, which Wiper would slot in. Unfortunately, Everton were no slouches, as minutes later, Harrison found Garner at the top of the box, and Muller was too slow in closing him down. Oh, sh I While I was handing praise to Muller earlier on, age seems to have caught up. Nevertheless, bring on the second half. Can you find Viper? Yes, Viper! I mean, Viper! Viper, Viper, whatever you want to call him. 2-1, Shaka. Corner kick now, Osmani's whipping it in. Back post, Jens. Yes! Jens, oh, what a knee slide, yes! A lovely two-goal advantage, but switching to a system I used to keep a lead proved pointless. After Pablo Torre somehow didn't take advantage of this, Rejcik makes an awful error with Ramon Sosa taking complete advantage. That's not the first case of the pole doing something like this, which I think comes down to his less than stellar composure. Don't you fear though. Clear, now we can counter. Pablo Torre, it's just him. It's just Pablo Torre on his own. Pablo Torre, Pablo Torre. Bro, this guy. This guy's the most unserious person in this competition. And guess what? That would cost us, as for some reason, the referee called this as a penalty. What? No, 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 referee. What, 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 what? 
What? Calvert Lewin wasn't getting to that. And now Everton can equalize in added time. What a disgraceful call. Kamada stepping up. He stopped. Suck on these nuts, referee. Despite all that nonsense, we still had the. Offside, right? Offside. Despite all that nonsense, we still had the advantage, but had Bayern in between the second leg. If we were victorious, we'd move into a Champions League spot. However, the Bavarians needed victory to return, in their minds, to their rightful place. It looked like it wasn't going to be our night, with them scoring first. Great. Bayern squeezing out another Bundesliga title. But with 30 to go, we equalized. Bayern also had a European semi-final to worry about couldn't muster up a winner. Drop points on both ends meant top four was unlikely, but Stuttgart had the title in their grasp. The second leg at the recently built Bramley Moore Dock Stadium was tense. One match from a European final, and that soon turned into 45 minutes. It was a quiet game, and I wanted nothing more. Regrettably, we had one lapse of judgment, letting Calvert-Lewin completely free. The majority of our attackers were struggling, as this headed to extra time. This leads to the 102nd minute, where Everton are in control of possession. We nearly won the ball off them, but they kept going, and Carrera was dragged out of position, leaving space for Sosa to make a decision. And our poor marking made that easy for the Toffees. Everton nearly gave us a gift, but got away with their error, unlike us. Despite pushing, we couldn't find it, and were eliminated. It's always frustrating when your attack under delivers. But that's how it goes sometimes. We would go on to win our last game of the campaign, finishing in 5th, missing out on the Champions League via goal difference. An improvement from last season, but the real story in the Bundesliga was Stuttgart, who triumphed on the final day at Wolfsburg to lift the shield, winning their first title since 2007, 150-1. It wasn't just our odds for the league, but the eventual winners as well. Christian Fjell would be lauded as a hero, while Harry Kane had the biggest fall off in football history. Schalke finishing above Dortmund for the first time since 2018 caused a lot of conversations. The reason for Dortmund's struggles? It's gotta be Kareem Adeyemi. I'm sure if I was his manager, me and him, we wouldn't get along. Wow, I think a little bit embarrassing. With Dortmund needing a new boss and no European football, it would be a perfect opportunity to retool and turn them back around. Why are you looking at Joachim Crew? I know he looks a little psychotic, but he's no traitor. We'll get to Dortmund when we face them later on, but both of us start off hot. The previous campaign's runner-up for manager of the season had to make some big transfers, and the most expensive was Michel Pelletier for 25 million plus bonuses. He wasn't ready to start in my opinion, but Jens' preseason injury gave Kovacevic an opportunity. Next up, after losing to his club last year, Alan Jung arrived for 8.25 million. This guy is a prodigy playmaker who is good defensively. The final one at the moment for under 15 mil, a man from Brazil named Gabriel Duarte Correa. Gabriel Duarte Correa. I planned to play him as a camp due to his 11 pace, but as the fixtures went on, that improved. So maybe next year, we'll have a lethal striker on our hands. It was a tough start to the campaign, hosting RB Leipzig on night one. However, with the odds on favor to achieve the top scorer's cannon, Nelson Wiper backed the media's prediction with a brace. Granted, there was some help. The challenges kept arriving with an away trip to the Bay Arena. Our opening two opponents were above us on the season preview, but as the odds showed previously, those clearly don't matter. Luca joined Wiper in the fun with a brace of his own in only 16 minutes. Wiper 2. Go on another counter attack, Wiper. It's just him. Him. Two on one. Oh, he's too fast for them. I am him. Boom! While Top posted out, heading out an emphatic 4 1 win. We were having a party, and it turned into a bender with a few newly promoted clubs. Duisburg first, with Luca finding a second brace, and Wiper grabbing a goal himself. Something to note is that we probably bought their best player named Niels Rosa, a promising defensive midfielder. However, he was meant to be Chernikov's understudy, until the I also had Riedel who could play there, but after the transfer window shut, he suffered an ACL injury. Yet our form wasn't affected, and with the oh so long return of Hamburg back to the Bundesliga, we beat them 3-1 with another Luka brace, and we Draogo joining the fun. To wrap up a fifth victory in a row, Osmani's brace secured that versus Werder Bremen. However, Dortmund kept up, 
and actually won their first seven games. We could only manage six. As a draw to Hoffenheim occurred, thanks to a late long shot. Thankfully, Beifau Bay finally dropped points with a donut to Leipzig, meaning a win versus Gladbach puts us on top on goal difference. Unfortunately, that wouldn't happen, with a second minute shot from Raquel May somehow finding the net. While we did respond with a penalty, terrible marking, and the box turning into a game of pinball led to the eventual winner. Thankfully, we were given an additional opportunity to go on top with Dortmund losing to Köln in their next match. Unlike last time, we took advantage, but not without hard work. Wolfsburg opened the encounter, but we responded with a Schallenberg slobber knocker and Osmani stealing the ball from the defender's blind side to hand us first place. Still a long way to go until the end, and unlike Beifau Bay, we had Europe to focus on. The league phase where we played 8 fixtures went very well, seeing us place in 4th, undefeated, and off to the round of 16. Notable moments included defeating AC Milan, which was the club that Zerbi won too, Wiper with 5 against Bosnia's Zrinski Mostar, and the debut of Young Min's son. You right, Arsenal? He's the same for you! He's the same for Ari! I know he went through the Saudi Arabia pipeline and money can make you do wild things, but that's crazy that he actually went there. Regardless, he arrived in late January, and there has been a lot of action since we last left off. I can't explain this, but we clearly don't like the DFB Pokal. This brought on our first run of bad form. On match day 10, Dortmund defeated Bayern, putting the pressure on us to reclaim the throne. We visited Frankfurt, hoping to achieve our plan. Yet Hugo Larsson running unmarked and David Washington scoring a cheeky rebound brought forth this setback. You knew it was bad when we drew Lugano in the Europa League, followed by another stalemate, this time with Freiburg. The top four remained tight, but there were a few teams missing. Yeah, what about last year's Bundesliga winner Stuttgart? It's easy to play well when you don't have European football, but add those games and you got yourself a tricky situation. As Christian Fuchs once said, it's incredibly difficult to play in the Champions League on a Wednesday night, having all that adrenaline coursing through your veins while playing on the biggest stage in football, and then coming home and trying to fall asleep so you can recover and resume your normal training schedule for the weekend league matches. That seemed to explain Stuttgart's situation. Then they had to visit us, just to receive a 5-star beatdown with Osmani and Widraogo cooking specifically. Their hero, Christian Fiel, was sent packing. Still listed as a favorite personnel, although you hate to see something incredible tainted. So Bayern are ninth place. <laughs> with them becoming quite inconsistent over the years, Tool finally led them to Champions League glory with a penalty shootout victory over Arsenal. But cracks are being shown. Key players of the previous decade began to leave for greener pastures, or greener bills. And the replacements, while good, were either not up to the previous standard, or just not used. That's why getting our first win versus them felt like a significant switch in Bundesliga power. Who knows how long this will last for, but you have to swing when the head is open. The biggest Revier derby in years. Separated by two points, we faced off with a new manager, Pellegrino Matarazzo. Having to now deal with frustrating 5-back formations seemed like an increasing trend in Germany. Yet, yeah, we initially did well. Carrera found a great ball to Widra Ogo, however, he couldn't beat Kobo. Then, with 3 passes, Dortmund got into our final third, and Pelletier allowed Adiemi too much space, seeing him tuck home the opener. That must have been a lucky shot, since we let him through again, which he skied. We were a mess and couldn't string two passes together. When we finally got our heads out of our asses, Widraogo was sent through once more, but completely flubbed it up. The second half was quieter than Old Trafford on a European night, as nothing occurred. The yellow wall extended their lead on us. Add another frustrating loss to the list with Ward Cajera's red card before halftime against Bochum. We tried to hold on, but Poheta made sure that wouldn't happen. A couple more wins brought the Hinrunda to an end, with us still in a Champions League spot. Unfortunately, we were 8 points behind Borussia Dortmund. The new year came in with the attempt to build ourselves back up. So Leverkusen at home saw us concede first. Happy New Year! We weren't deterred, as Grimal was bold enough to take a long shot. He obviously didn't score, but our Danish wonder kid Jung had more conviction, smacking the bar and the ball crossing over the line. We were taking control of this. But the half arrived. Not long after the restart, Schick was sent in. And it didn't cross the line. Luck was with us, as 10 minutes later, Carrera was found. 
and his cross was parried into Wiper's butt, with Karius having no chance. A unique, game-winning goal. Despite that, we were still 8 points out of reach, and with RB Leipzig next, many predicted it was either them or us in this title challenge. We're in their box. Ooh, no, never mind. Wait, back, almost in their box. Ooh. Young! Second game in a row with a goal azul. The Tin Cans had to be wondering what they could do now. Grab that. How did you miss the ball, Montipo? Montipo's massive mistake caused their confidence to spiral from 100 to zero, spreading across the team swiftly, as Grimal decided to make a one-time pass to Amos to give Leipzig the lead. I didn't even want to include Carrera's awful throw. Danny almost smacking the bar concluded their danger for the first half. We needed a massive response or risk going 11 behind the leaders. I signed this guy in the summer to be my rotational left back and to give us a different option for that position. On the other side, we would make another error to concede a third. Why, Montipo, what is your performance, man? At least dive the right way. We did earn one. But before I could think about becoming Le Cru James, Simakin decided to dance around us and get Leipzig's fourth. I was frustrated as all hell, dropping Montipo for the rest of the season, nearly doing the same with Grimo, and seeing us drop 11 points behind Dortmund. In Montipo's place was Jonas Urbe, who improved with more games played. He was bought for 8.5 million. With him and Son at the club, we were able to turn around the form with several narrow victories. 7 wins and 1 draw leading to a Europa League encounter with Ajax. Rule number one for European knockouts. Don't rotate your entire team. I had more faith in my squad than I should have because what I witnessed nearly made me type control alt delete. Enter the mess. First, Konseisa was taking a shot, but it was so crap that it smacked his own teammate in the head. However, it ricocheted into the net. Martin van Dijk doesn't look too special to me. But instead of getting concussed, he suddenly turned into the next boss Dost. The man was able to jump over my taller fullback, once for a goal, and another that missed the net. As the second half went on, I was desperate not to let the game slip. Unfortunately, we allowed the actual tallest man on the pitch to score from a corner, and what I swore is the biggest name I've ever heard, Ferry van den Uwe, grabbed the fourth before the final whistle. I was flabbergasted at how bad we were, and playing my best team in the home tie wasn't enough. This was a massive missed opportunity. Why? Let's have a look at the following rounds. I explained Wolfsburg, who they lost to. Not only that, every single English side were eliminated before the semi-finals, and so were AC Milan. That led to an all Lisbon final, which Benfica won. So if I didn't overlook Ajax, a European trophy was actually doable. Thankfully, with our good form prior, we were able to bring the point gap down to one and actually pass Dortmund. They went on a poor run, which included the annual loss to Bayern when it really mattered. Leipzig were playing outstandingly, only drawing two matches since our fixture. They added to that on the 28th match day, meaning we could move into first place with a win versus Freiburg. This ray of hope was what we needed, and we Ogo nearly gave us a dream start. Yet, things came to a standstill with nothing happening until the most controversial call of March 19th, 2028. This tackle by Schallenberg would go down in infancy, barely in the box. Far gives a penalty, which Junior Adamo slots in. A pathetic response from us, and a terrible end to this season. We drew to Stuttgart right after, and in a do or die Revier derby, Adiemi would yet again find space and score with his right foot. Our attack shriveled up, while Dorman continued to roll on, confirming the Bundesliga title on the penultimate match day. Leipzig were no match in the final run-in. The sole positive to all of this was that Bayern missed out on the top four, meaning they'll be playing in the Europa League. Tuchel was sacked, seeing the Bundesliga title curse continue. That being, any manager that wins it eventually gets sacked, unless if they use the four triple two narrow. Now, who will the Bavarians bring in? Wayne Rooney. That would be great. Hey, check out my Twitch. Well, you don't have to, unless if you like live streams. I currently stream a couple times a week, usually Football Manager, but I may try some other stuff. Check the schedule on my page to see when I'll be live. The return of Pep Guardiola to Bayern was something I never needed to see. Pep Guardiola is coming. The man dominated and revolutionized German football, but had a blemish on his record. 
defeating Joaquim Cruz. Well, I guess I wasn't a manager back then. What a beautiful surname he has. Of course, the flaw was the Champions League, a competition Pep wouldn't be seeing. What? They finished in fifth! Well, we're entering it for the first time. Thanks to that, 63 million was given to spend. Big transfers were required, and one was Daiki Ogawa. Fight like a butterfly, seem like a bee. The Blackpool native arrived for 40 million. I intended to play him at center back, but he ended up rotating with Niels Rosa at the anchor position. Next up, from Basel, we signed Adriano Onyegule for less than 10 mil. I swear, this guy's way too similar to Widra Ogo. Both have first names that start with A, a surname beginning with O, are German with West African origins, tall, born a month apart, and their attributes are nearly identical with a couple slight differences. I'm just imagining what AO squared could do. Finally, Yusuf Musa arrived on a free from AC Milan, and his attributes led him to be my rotational right back with Boot loaned. Based on the opening match of the campaign, you'd expect great things from us with a 4-0 victory over Hoffenheim. That's what you call false confidence. And we learned that the hard way at Stuttgart. During preseason, we suffered a bunch of injuries, preventing several to gain proper match sharpness. Plus, our number one keeper was out. That led to a difficult encounter at the MHP Arena, facing a former friend, Lorenzo Luca, who we sold to our opponents for 30 million. A hero for us? But with his scoring tally dwindling and me wanting to fizzle out the target forward role, parting ways seemed to be the best. However, that wasn't the case for me. On two occasions, he received the ball onto the right flank and was allowed to make the same exact cross to Vodarczyk. Luka helped make Stuttgart a serious team again, with 14 goals throughout the campaign and only 15 starts. It wasn't going well, especially in October and November. Several drop points in the league had me question the beautiful 4 2 narrow. That resulted in experimenting with a 4 3 2 1 using three defensive midfielders. What the hell is this? It ended up looking like this and was used versus Pep's Bayern Munich. Looking at them, they certainly have a strong front three of Mathis Tal, Shale de Roop, and Gonzalo Morera. They also brought in old man Mark Andre Ter Stegen in net, and Carlos Baleba looks like an unreal midfielder. Yet, a few key men were missing, and they have a relatively small squad of quality, all things considered. This match had decent opportunities on both ends, but it'd be the Bavarians who opened it up. Mathis Tell getting on the end of this cross. Don't you worry, we responded straight away with Onyek Bule getting it in behind to Wiper for the equalizer. Unfortunately, we were in bad form for a reason. Simple mistakes being made, like two pressing Sheldarup leaving Baleba wide open in the box for their second. They continued to create chances, yet did a terrible job taking them. We weren't letting them walk over us though, and became adventurous. That risk paid off in the 90th minute, as Widrago passed to a pile of players, which found Wiper for the equalizer. A missed header by Byron at the end confirmed a very good draw, leading to a confused face on Pep as we shaked hands. Oh, <laughs> Could that result be the turnaround we need? We lost to Bochum 2-0. Yeah, no Bundesliga wins in six straight fixtures. What? And while reverting to the 4 triple 2 brought three victories on the bounce, a narrow loss to Dortmund on match day 17 had us placed in sixth, five points from fourth, and not even close to first. It's not ideal to have combined losses and draws higher than our triumphs. There were two big issues in my opinion. Goal scoring was a glaring one, but the other was at left back. For this entire adventure, I used an inverted fullback, and it usually was Matriciani. The problem was the lack of width it provided. I never had a left-sided version of Carrera, who had the quality to go forward. Unlike Matriciani, Bjorkan would have solved this problem, but I stupidly sold him in the summer. With the winter sale of Moritz Jens, that led to a lot of money available in January. So, Alex Valle was bought from Atletico Madrid for 29 million. Now, I can use wingbacks on both sides. Several tactical changes were made, including the return of the target forward. It was paired with an advanced forward, and either could be filled in by Wiper. I made him the big man, since I decided to give a kid from the academy a chance. Eric Holthaus arrived at the Knappenschmiede Academy many years ago, along with Niklas Brosch and a few other promising players, several of whom are still at the club. Unfortunately, our youth intake lost its magic touch after getting a new head of youth development. Except for this guy. Maybe one day. Still, our academy is regarded as the third best in the world, 
and with Holthouse going from a goldfish brain to a legitimate pacey striker, he would be quite useful. Numerous balls began being sent in behind opponents' back lines, which meant great things for Holthouse. And subsequently, us. Three goals from him in the first four Rukurunda matches led to three wins and a draw. Nice momentum right before the knockout playoff round of the Champions League. Our first ever Champions League campaign was relatively mixed. In the league phase, we got the victories we're supposed to get, drew clubs that are probably at our level, and lost to some pretty good teams. That resulted in 20th place, so in order to get to the round of 16, we needed to play RB Leipzig over two legs. It's always a challenging encounter. All we have to do is look earlier this season, where we drew 1-1 in a tight contest. Updating their squad for you, they still have a few regulars, including Amos Opeyemi. He's joined by Super Eagle teammate Victor Aletu, who was our former loanee. Vandervoort is their keeper, but my biggest fear is their center back, Lukeba who I'm surprised hasn't been bought by Real Madrid. Simakan, as we've learned in the past, is one to be careful of too, as was showcased in the fifth minute. It's not like I gave him tons of space to make that cross, but it was only a temporary setback. We showed danger prior, but it took nearly half an hour to find ourselves. Several first-time passes broke down Leipzig's shape, leading to Holthouse to equalize. An offside scare in the second half kept us on our toes, and the luck would continue. Less than 10 minutes to go, and Carrera's cross doesn't find a target, but Stanisic's clearance smacks our player, leading to Osmani cleaning up the scraps and handing us the first leg advantage. Heading to the away tie, I knew they needed to go at us, so cautious was the way to go. Weirdly enough, we were maintaining more possession and creating huge chances. This Holdhouse crossbar smack made me think it was one of those days. But Wiper soon after put my worries to bed. A two goal advantage and Leipzig weren't threatening. Although they grew desperate and began clawing their way back. Then off a corner, the second ball returned to the taker, Batorina, who was having a shocking performance. So nobody decided to press him. That error, which I have no idea how to prevent, switched everything. Another offside scare led to the final 10 minutes, which saw me make changes to protect the lead. Except, we didn't learn from our previous mistake. Batarina received the ball in the box, and Carrera gave him so much room to shoot on his strong foot for the equalizer. I know you can tell your team to show certain players on their weaker foot, but shouldn't this be an obvious thing to do as a defender? Annoyingly, this went to extra time, where we reverted to the 4 triple 2 narrow and scored 39 seconds into the period. Leipzig responded straight away, where Rosa teleports around Aletu, allowing him to find the sharpest player on the pitch for the equalizer. No, I'm not being harsh. This guy is garbage and was still left open. We then hit the post, and Leipzig nearly stole this tie at the death. Penalties are here, and I'm just a little annoyed that we haven't advanced. Doubly so, seeing the quality of our penalty takers, turning a guy good at them, confused and demotivated, Raychik actually scored his. But Jung was stopped, while Leipzig slotted every single one, eliminating us from the competition. I was frustrated until I realized the tin cans had to play Manchester City. While they had to deal with Holland twice, they became easy pickings in our Bundesliga encounter where our season stars Holthouse, Wiper, and Osmani contributed. The latter, by the way, had another great year statistically, despite his attributes not being as good compared to others. The form was picking itself up, finding ourselves in the top four spots. But my true goal was the DFB Pokal. We hadn't gone past the third round in four attempts, but with a 4-1 victory over Kiel, we finally reached the quarters. We hosted Stuttgart, whose earlier victory against us was long erased by a 4-0 slaughtering at the beginning of the Ruk Runda. Yep, they were performing admirably with Lorenzo Luca and manager Thomas Lech. Our plan was to find Holthouse in behind, and that worked but either he was more offside than Darwin Nunez or missed some really good chances. I could sub him off, but he's at least been a threat. And as we approached the 65th minute, our new wingback made use of his width, finding Onyek Bule, who in turn assisted Wiper for the opener. Our opponents decided to switch from their boring five back, which gave me the idea to sub on Musa. Musa? I've got to say, I'm a genius just for that. 
we moved on to the semifinals, where our opponents would be Hamburg, Dortmund, or Bayern. And I know which one I want. Please be Hamburg. He's so sad. Uh, quite unfortunate. And in the lead-up, our form slightly drifted with a loss to Leverkusen and drawing her to Berlin. That temporarily knocked us out of the top four. And with Bayern after the March international break, we'd have a little bit of a dress rehearsal prior to the semis. They've been dominant in the league but began to show cracks with a few underwhelming results. We were running into issues ourselves, with OA squared both injured. I'm sorry though, are you overlooking Osmani once again? An early opener led to our best performance of the season. We were piling on chances, while the Bavarians wouldn't earn a sniff in our box. The second half saw Kovacevic of all people dribbling his way to make it two, and a third found by Wiper. A 3-0 win, with no shots allowed. Now, can we do this in the DFB Pokal semis? A chance to make our first final. And disaster struck. They got a shot. Not a problem for us. As 22 minutes in. Back to Herrera. Jung. Yes! Jung. Even Ter Stegen wouldn't save that. Harry Kane at center mid was a nice idea, Pep. But we continued to pile on the pressure. Less clinical this time. However, the final whistle grew closer with little to worry. Although, in the dire moments... No. Oh, what a miss by Tal. We made our first cup final and would face Hamburg. A Revier derby would be cooler, but Bayern would let out their frustrations against the future finalists on the following weekend. For ourselves, four tight wins in the Bundesliga took us to the last match day of the campaign. We got ourselves into third place, but with Dortmund as our opponents, a lot of possibilities were present. It was less than dramatic. A 1-1 one -one draw seeing the both of us finish in the top four. To be fair, Leipzig did bottle it. And nope, Germany didn't earn an extra spot. Nevertheless, the DFB Pokal final was up. Our opposition was Hamburg, who ended the Bundesliga in last with just 11 points. Just a single tally more than the record earned by Tasmania Berlin. Although we can't really talk since Schalke nearly broke one of Tasmania Berlin's records nearly a decade ago. Anyways, Hamburg's return to the top flight lasted a mere two campaigns. And with them hiring Daniel Chiun three weeks after Wolfsburg sacked him, it seemed that he remained in the job only due to their cup success. But in our two encounters this season, we've won by a combined score of 6-0. Speaking of goals, their top scorer Philippe Tietz had five, and the next closest were several, with two. Yet, they miraculously got here. Unfortunately for them, their cam got injured early on, and we were seemingly all over them. However, we lose the ball, and they begin their counterattack, making plays down the left wing. What the? And we concede. No worries. We were creating chances. It was only a matter of time before we got one in. Surely something's gonna happen soon for us. Off the bar. Oh, what? He saved that follow up? How? Let's go. Volley wins it back. Beats a man. Cross in. Over the bar. I'm, I don't want that guy there. I'm sorry, Holtice. You've not done enough. Max, I need you. One, I need you. But were they ready? They recently returned from injury, and they weren't doing well with their match sharpness. I also forgot to mention that Jung was injured. What impact will they make? If any. <laughs> Osmani? A wiper seals it! Yes! Back in it. And we're ready to win it. Good. No! No! What is going on? This was getting ridiculous. Hoy Fernandez was having the match of his life as the reality of this was starting to set in. In order to extend this match, we needed a goal desperately. We draw a goal, Mo Mo Moors. What the? Why are you shooting that? Why are you shooting that? Why? What makes you think this is the best option shooting up first time? What about maybe cutting outside and taking this space? And then potentially having either a shot closer to the net or wiper open for a tap in or even more start open for a tap in. Am I really gonna lose this final? Yes. I can't believe this. This is fing bullshit. We lose the cup final to a team with 
11 fucking points in the league? We beat Bayern Munich to get here, and we lose to Hamburg? Bayern and Dortmund, a one-sided rivalry for the longest time. Things changed when Matarazzo's Beifal Bay won the league two seasons ago, so the Bavarians responded with Pep Guardiola. Please sit back, let us cook, and voila! Merci beaucoup! <laughs> Merci! This pair are again the strongest clubs in Germany after a few weird years, while we remain the third wheel. Bayern had Harry Kane moving further into midfield, allowing Mathis Tell and Vitor Roque more opportunities in the offensive third. Added with the free transfer from Pong and purchasing Vagoman from Stuttgart. They also kept stealing my youth academy players! I don't need it. I don't need it. They don't even have that much potential! And they stunned me on deadline day by purchasing Musa via his release clause. I've never been so blindsided. On Dortmund's end, Karim Adiemi is someone you all should know, but Benjamin Sheshko was bought from Munich last campaign, strengthening their offense. That's alongside Karim Kanate, giving them a pacey attack. Then there's their academy graduate, Max Alstite, who can find these guys and take chances for himself. Defensively, they aren't as good as Bayern, yet Real Walters was a dangerous option at right wing back. How do we respond? I like my starting 11, so I brought in some rotation options to push the starters. That wasn't Nathan Zeze from Lech Poznan, although Sali Salihovic's pace provided an interesting option at left back. Emre Salman was an intriguing prospect from Turkey, whose under 21s won the Euros this past summer. Finally, I couldn't pass on Leonardo Hebeschini of Fluminense, who actually started on opening day because of preseason injuries, having them miss the start of the campaign, which on paper looked incredibly difficult. However, that turned into the greatest start ever. Onyekbuli's brace versus RB Leipzig was very promising, and our new Brazilian getting on the score sheet at Leverkusen made us look like a real threat. Another goal from the Brazilian versus Gladbach wasn't enough, but a returning Holdhouse grabbing a late winner was. It was important not to let the biggest embarrassment in my time at Schalke impact this season. With a somewhat easy Champions League schedule coming up, all I could think was more wins on the board. With 10 men, we only managed to draw a recently promoted Duisburg. Well, at least we got a penalty versus Ajax. Another draw. A tuna lead with Freiburg? And we can see the equalizer in the 87th minute. Making it worse, we drew Viking one all thanks to a 90 second minute goal from them. Bouncing back is the only thing we could do until we visited Pep Guardiola and lost our undefeated streak to them. Okay. Not due to Pep's beautiful football, but instead, we decided to play short passes while suffocated by their press, and Kovacevic did this and instantly regretted it. I play slightly more direct. Why are we doing this? All right, Bohum should be no problem. By the way, who's their manager? Damien Duff? Damien do it, make me laugh now. Ibernian insurance, pretty good. <laughs> yeah, very funny. Bohum have actually turned into a decent Bundesliga club, but at home, they should be dealt with. However, Valle decided to get himself sent off before half time. We were able to keep the score tied, but defending with 10 men proved too difficult by the end. What other whack jobs do we still have to get through? Ah, drawing Real Madrid, not too shabby. What about Mainz and Michelin? Well, that's not right. Oh. Even with December becoming a really good month, including a massive victory over Dortmund, moments like this Frankfurt equalizer left me irritated. I did sell Raychik to them, but he didn't do anything. Despite all those frustrations, we earned the most points we've ever received by the midway point, yet Bayern remained undefeated. Have mess in the past, have Haaland now, this is my success. An increase in transfer budget was given in January, which saw me find a proper right back cover in Simone Valde of Gladbach. It took nearly 30 million to bring him in, but it required more to sign Elijah Smith. An outstanding goalkeeper from Middlesbrough, he would play in the cup competitions while Urbig would play in the league. The second half of the season began brilliantly. Wins once again over Leipzig, Leverkusen, and Gladbach. Although the latter two were no longer impressive. That's due to them both in a relegation battle, where by the end, Gladbach actually got relegated. We kept winning, but had a slight tumble to Freiburg once again. 
A 1-0 loss happens, but let's look into the details. We leveled it up in the 65th minute, but it was ruled offside. Looking at it closely, it said Jung was the offender. Well, I guess there's nothing to argue then. VAR is always correct. The ball went to Wiper, and he was the one who put it in. If we look at it closely, Jung is offside, but Wiper wasn't. Jung does go towards the ball, but never touches it or interferes with a defender. So why was it called off? We later also had a huge chance to equalize, but an incredible stop was made by Montipo. Montipo. Ah uh, yes, I loaned him to Freiburg. Post game, I looked at his profile and saw I could recall him and send him to the second team. Nevertheless, even Bayern would fall into a rough run of form, which led to their title race becoming wide open. That was emphasized by defeating them in the league 2-1. Goals from our two Brazilians. A surprising win after conceding early, which put us above them in the table. However, Dorman in the Rook Runda hadn't lost a single game. It seems crazy and gets wilder when you realize they defeated the Bavarians at the Allianz. That hasn't happened since 2017 and not in the Bundesliga since Jurgen Klopp's final year in 2014. Although, they did lose once in Germany by this point in 2030. At Signal Duna Park, we faced Borussia Dortmund in the third round. An unfortunate draw, especially sandwiched between our fixtures with Leipzig and Leverkusen. Yet, we were looking great with Holthaus opening it up by rounding the keeper. Then, Karim Adeyemi would not let me relax, as he was found past our defense to smack one in tied at the half, but minutes into the restart, we had our other German striker, Nelson Wiper, giving us back the lead. Not long later, Ogawa made it 3. This was looking good, but a rare Jung mistake led to Adeyemi grabbing his brace. Thankfully, that's the closest they got, as we moved on to the quarterfinals. In the next round, it was Bayern. Are you taking the piss? Away from home too, and her form leading to this was brutal. This was our placement after we got Holland, and we were drawn with Benfica in the playoff round. Benfica got their European trophy years ago, when it should have been me, but despite some rotation defensively, I thought we were the favorites. It seems so with an early goal from our boy Wiper. However, they sent a ball in behind to Marcos Leonardo, and it seemed like Elijah Smith was going to sweep it. Well, Grimal's right there. He can just kick it out. How did... Ooh, what the... How did both of you miss that? The defenders allowed him space for a second, leading to both center halves being subbed off. We were able to save face with an equalizer, and then a potential lifeline arrived. The man with the brace, Marcos Leonardo. Menino da Vila. Getting his marching orders. A whole half to find the advantage, but Elton had other plans. We just gave it to him, and he dribbled unopposed, taking the lead for Benfica. We were unable to find another, losing at home to 10 men. And with me being desperate in the second leg, my team got absolutely smoked out of their house. I wasn't having a good time, and the two matches before Bayern in the DFB Pokal was my breaking point. We visited Damien Duff's Bochum, and saw Oliver Sorek's terrible cross bounce off Pelletier's rear end, deflecting to Mursal. We equalized minutes later, but in the second half, Piccoli was found in behind, but Kovacevic was there to intercept. No, 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 no. What I this? No, this game! No, 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 no! What? Once again, we got an equalizer. Even so, I've long lost my sense of joy, especially since we didn't win. So, what happened versus Wolfsburg? Well, we actually got on board first, and seemed to be creating the better chances. However, their defensive midfielder, with 6 finishing, somehow beat my goalkeeper from this wide angle at his near post. If it was Sergio Aguero, fine, I can somewhat understand, but Joris Schotard doing this? Come on now. Then, the following. A pretty poor long ball was sent in, and my right-sided center back had more than enough of a lead to get there first. But he turns around and slows down as Wimmer blasts by and finds the winner. Mate, Margot Robbie ain't calling you. Why are you losing focus? We had a chance late to equalize, but missed this from a yard out. So the DFB Pokal quarterfinal versus Bayern was next. 
and we were receiving a pummeling, with Tell scoring early with a far post header. They were getting closer and closer for another, until minutes before the interval, where Marrera grabbed that second. Yet, yeah, we weren't stopping the fight. Holdhouse got through, but was stopped. The next 45 minutes roll around, and it stays quiet. No goals or real chances for us until the 90th minute where Bayern made a huge mistake. We'd hit the post with a final chance as we got eliminated from the DFB Pokal. The standings in the Bundesliga placed us in third, 10 points behind Borussia with 7 matches left. I threw in the white flag as we weren't catching up. Each half of the league contained 17 matches and in the latter, they won 16 of them to clinch the shield with 84 points. That's tied for the most in this save. What's crazier, despite in my opinion them having an above average defense, their goalkeeper Kobel remains fantastic as he kept 12 clean sheets in those games. One less than what my keeper had in the entire campaign. I thought the yellow wall was falling off, but clearly I was wrong. We do have a young team and the players are developing. So I'm just waiting until this team explodes. However, my patience is growing thin, and I might just have one more left in me. Duh, shit. For those interested about how Hamburg did in the Europa League as a second division team, they got to the playoff round by finishing in 10th. However, their journey ended quickly to Udo Goretz. With Pep Guardiola out as Bayern boss, maybe they'll become weak again. <laughs> Fem fantastic. Maybe I should have taken the Bayern offer or even the Real Madrid interview. Regardless, this is going to be my final season. So with almost 50 million given, who did I purchase by opening day? There was one player I wanted, and his name was Piero Hincapié, a center back not only strong in marking and tackling, but he was aggressive, which I can't say about Pelletier or Kovacevic. However, the Ecuadorian had a 77 million release clause, and Leverkusen were not budging for less. That meant many who were the building blocks to this point had to be sold. Thank you to the services of Leo Graimel, fullback Teon Bulut, and the ever so reliable Henning Matriciani. Still, that wasn't enough, meaning more players had to go, including academy graduate Gabsi, not Sadio Mane, and Lorenzo Cruz, who was a Mexican striker bought a few years ago. I also cashed in on a couple academy players' buyout clauses. Finally, I had to get rid of the hidden gem of Tristan Osmani. I will never forget the big moments he brought, unlike Keke Top, who was sold last season. It's just a shame he couldn't develop further. Sacrificing a little heart to sign a defender may hurt, but it will be worth it. I mean, no, it's very simple. Heading into the new season with the same exact team, we had to play Frankfurt on match day one. This year, I made some tactical adjustments, such as using a complete forward instead of a target. In the team, you wouldn't see Jung, as he had multiple preseason injuries. That means you'll see more of Sarure, a promising midfielder who's been capped by Argentina. The main faces you'll see this campaign include last January's transfer of Elijah Smith and Net, the Spanish fullbacks of Alex Valle and Sergio Carrera, the pacey center half of Vladimir Kovacevic, normally partnered with Michel Pelletier. In the anchor role, our new captain Niels Rosa was favored. The camps will see the two Brazilians start, Although, AO Squared will fill those roles too. Up top, we will continue to go with the Germans of Nelson Wiper and Eric Holthaus. Despite Frankfurt setting up in a 5-back, they were piling on the shots while we couldn't find a sniff. So, I cooked something up in the kitchen to allow us to play with width. Maybe I shouldn't have, because 30 seconds past the added minutes, the ref allowed a throw in, and all our guys were confusingly standing there as Chaibi gets the easiest goal of his life. I was hoping for a promising second half response, but this counterattack, or lack thereof, summed up this performance. An opening loss, which tends to be a bad omen. I was waiting for Incapié's agent to allow negotiations to reopen up. Meanwhile, we faced his client the following week. I felt better about this, especially when their best defender started at left back. That doesn't mean they lack scoring threats, as Chan Uzun did brilliantly until striking the ball wide. So from one German to another, Eric Holthaus decided to show how it was done. Leverkusen still threatened, but their lack of conviction cost them, as Wiper soon doubled the lead. They did make the match uncomfortable though. Not long after the half, a bullet header from Marine slashed the lead. Thankfully, we held out and found the third laid on. 
Similar to last year's schedule, RB Leipzig visited us early on. I do think we're better than them, but AO squared and attack didn't remain for long with another injury from Widra Ogo. Look at this list, it's like I'm reading an index. Nevertheless, the other AO stepped up. Receiving a header from Sarue, he drove forward and his shot deflected off Lukeba, ruling out his transfer to Real Madrid. Leipzig were doing everything they could to get anything on the ball. In the 54th minute, Esteve would do the opposite of his partner and put it into the correct net. Since their thoughts were on goals, why don't they concede some more? Wiper gets one from this nice passage of play while getting a brace at the far post. All within a little over 10 minutes. We had to ride some luck along the way, but Leipzig were tamed with the exact same scoreline as last year. The recovery from a rough first match was nice, but I had over 80 million and I needed to spend it. Attempt 2 on Hincapié worked, making him tied for the highest paid man in the squad. I also transferred a Polish striker from Legia Warszawa named Dariusz Polak. The man certainly had a transformation, although he was loaned back until January. For Hincapié's debut, Duisburg seemed to be the perfect opponent. Not a bad club by any means, but we've only conceded a goal to them once in a competitive match. Smith even tried to help them, and they still missed. With us scoring twice, and Duisburg not able to get a shot on target, it seemed routine. Hincapié was apparently having a poor game compared to Palettier, despite a clean sheet being maintained, until the final 10, where while marking someone else, Petrovic came from the midfield to score right in front of him. Definitely a midfielder's fault, and we won, so the fans remained optimistic about the Ecuadorian. The Champions League schedule looked difficult for the most part, and it began with Napoli, who built themselves a mouth-watering attack. The ball dawn with hair, Baldanzi looked insane. On the wings, Badradin Buanani made my eyes pop out, and before I could put them back in, Ansu Fadi appeared on the other side. Okay, I'm gonna need some therapy. Jeremy Doku too? I'm not even including Faradona, who was injured. Their midfield had solid players as well, featuring Yavi Guerra, Anguisa, and Gaston Sosa. Defensively, they were a tad weaker, and we now had Incapié to make their attack all top. Uh, let's go worry about the Champions League matches for later while I go cry in the corner. Despite Niels Rosa getting sent off versus Wolfsburg, Schalke still managed to find a win, with Wiper catching our opponents against the run of play. Finally, we earned a clean sheet, with Hincapié on the bench. To finish off September, we visited Stuttgart, who lost their manager at the beginning of the month. Rumors began circulating about Allegri becoming the new man in charge, especially after a 1-0 win over Frankfurt. Then that quickly evaporated when they wasted their energy by actually scoring goals. Oh yuck. Instead, they brought in René Wagner, who got Leeds United back into the Premier League. We'd be his first opponent, so let's give him a welcoming party. <laughs> Nelson and Duarte, do it. Get him up, let him get up, let him get up, let him get up. Oh. Wiper grabbed a hat trick while the Brazilian Duarte Cajaya grabbed two along with three assists. But it's a shame in an international break, slowed down the momentum. Nuremberg were giving more problems than anticipated, with them equalizing the score in the 61st minute. It took time, but prior to the 90th, Salihovic delivered it to Wiper for the winner. This was also the game where Jung made his return, but he was struggling to get back into form. He stumbled against Damien Duff's Bohum, who were in last place, as it ended in a scoreless draw. A lot of tight results occurred against teams worse than us on paper. That was emphasized in the DFB Pokal versus Dinamo Dresden. Away at the lower divisions club, we got pushed into extra time. A victory was achieved by the end thanks to Nelson, but not being able to rest some players before Hoffenheim wasn't ideal. Dorka Heia opened it up a half hour in, but we couldn't find a second, no thanks to this Holthaus strike. Then, with five to go, before I was able to make a sub, Hoffenheim's corner led to another chance. With Leipzig and Dorming close in the table, it would be disheartening to drop below them. However, minutes before the 90, we won a free kick, and Onyek Boule stepped up. Yeah!
a clutch free kick to win this fixture, and with several more in the league, including a Dwarf Cahaya Braves vs Mainz, we were 3 points clear at the top. December brought more drama with Dortmund and Bayern coming up, but before them, nothing was going our way against Freiburg. I thought it was supposed to be easy, and it should have been, yet our scoring prowess was not here. Freiburg were inching closer to an undeserved draw. Corner kick, 92nd minute, top of the box on Yigbule, Dwart. Yes! Let's go! That took a lot of effort. However, we won, which I couldn't say concerning Cohen. Take the Freiburg match and delete the last minute winner, resulting in a nil-nil. Luckily, we still kept our small gap at the top, as we entered the toughest part of the season. What else is there to say about Dortmund? We're tired of seeing them limp the Bundesliga. A problem was Holhouse's awful form. He's got the physicals and mentals to be a threat, but his concentration and lack of consistency hindered him this campaign. I just can't give up on him yet. So we began, and they hit the woodwork from point blank range. All remained calm until half an hour in, where Wiper wins a header, leading to the most unorthodox of given goes between Duarte Cajaya and Valle, seeing the Brazilian open the encounter. A couple moments later, we would earn a penalty, seeing Nelson double our lead. An amazing first 45. If it wasn't for a great block, this game could have been settled post the interval, but Dorman kept themselves alive. They were mediocre today, but remained a threat, and we gave them too much space for Adeyemi's cutback towards Nementia. That was with 20 to go, and quickly after, they threatened again, leading to a moment of disaster for Pelletier. It was painful to lose that lead in what was going to be a great result. However, we've suffered through worse. A few subs were made, including Salmon or Holthouse, and in the 80th, Valle's delivery found his noggin to restore our lead. In Dortmund's frustration, Veraldo would get sent off, as we confirmed a massive win to keep ourselves in first. Now, it was time for Bayern. Jurgen Klopp was appointed as manager, which realistically, an evil version of him would do. But when I met him, he was quite the opposite. Bayern's results in Germany were pretty bad, which got names thrown at Jurgen like Blau, Wolf, Wright, Blusenfett, but I just called him Drunk Klopp. But I think that's not too important for us. Drunk or not, Bayern had a dangerous press to deal with. However, they made a massive error. Ball in the middle, but wait, wait, wait a minute. Duarte Cohea! What a move, what a finish! 1-0, Schalke! The leg got sent to the shops by our Brazilian. Still, this was Bayern, and they were threatening. A big save from Smith, a great defensive line, and the post kept our lead intact. Their shooting boots continued to lack, and with another miss, we were able to set up our team defensively to close out another big victory. Our first at the Allianz. And with Holthouse grabbing a brace versus Augsburg, we officially reached the end of the Hinrunda in first. 44 points, which was 10 more than last season. Dortmund and Leipzig dropping points should have kept us at ease. <laughs> Our final Ruprunda arrived, and if we remain in the title race, the ending of the season could be troublesome. Surviving January was crucial, and it began with Duarte Cajaya maintaining his form versus Leverkusen. Looking like the right-footed Aryan Robin, his strike would be added alongside Holthouse's. The German would hit the post at the beginning of the second half, but what seemed a sure win faded away. Arnau Martinez's cross was tapped in by a wide-open Kaminsky, and a few more close calls arrived. All the momentum shifted to Leverkusen, and they were able to complete the comeback. Some guy named Lorin Ulrich was sent in, and didn't have a great angle to shoot. No, that was his only goal in the Bundesliga. Then came the DFB Pokal third round, where of course, we would be drawn with Leipzig. Ignoring the match we don't talk about, the recent draws have been cruel, and Saruri's error led to the tin cans opening the affair. We weren't going to fall easily to them though, so Widraogo found Wiper, who neatly tucked in the equalizer. Although, it's not simple to win at their house, and that was showcased with Azon skipping past Valle, finding an unmarked Zewald for their second. Did we forget how to mark after the interval? The answer was a resounding... A fourth game sending us out of the competition, me suing the DFB for biased drawing selections, which resulted in a countersuit of defamation. Well, could we get revenge against the one team who beat us in the Bundesliga? Nil-nil draw. Well, what about revenge against the side that just beat us? Another nil-nil. 
4 drop points in the Bundesliga, men are lead, fell to 2, with Borussia Dortmund 4 behind. With that context, CHAMPIONS! Through 6 matches, we were placed in 7th, with the only blemish being an unlucky 3-0 loss to Real Madrid at home. And no, Napoli did not happen. Unlucky versus Madrid in the sense that they signed this striker instead of me! Regardless, I've never finished in the top 8 with Schalke, but it was going to be difficult with Juventus and Barcelona. We hosted the old lady first, and no matter what variation of the 4 triple 2 they used, Dorcaez's his masterful dribbling will cause you problems one way or another. And we'd head into the final fixture with a 2-0 victory thanks to Holthouse scoring his 50th goal for Schalke. Now in 6th place, there remained a couple contenders for the remaining spots, including our next opponents. Things became clear when Matchday 8's Tuesday fixtures finalized. Two of these three would likely fall out, with Manchester United facing Inter and Bayern surely defeating Lech Poznan. A draw will be enough for your boys, but I made a mistake. I don't even know what to say, bro. I've been using Urbig in the cup competitions, but forgot to put him in here. My strategy into this was hooving it up to the big men. Barcelona are filled with players that can't jump, while my lineup had nobody with an attribute below 13. The strategy nearly paid off in the 16th minute, but somehow we didn't equalize. Despite my plan, Lamine Yamal nearly scored a header himself. Later, they hit the bar by avoiding a normal corner. Then this somehow happened off another. A draw was still in reach, and instead of creating chances by hoofing it, a moment of complacency by Barca saw Widraogo capitalize, finding Wiper, leading to Zhao Nevz tackling the ball to Murstet for the equalizer. Fast forward to the closing moments, and Elijah Smith's kick of the pitch was easily won by Barca, and they were about to create the game deciding goal. But Elijah made a humongous save, seeing us leave with a draw. The plan didn't go as expected, but we did enough to finish in the top 8 right above Barca. No extra matches for us, which is huge, especially with Dortmund and Bayern in the same situation. Returning to the Bundesliga, it continued with a routine win over Duisburg. Wiper and Duarte both scored. The following day, Elijah Smith unfortunately suffered a virus infection. Not sure how, but I'd assume he'd recover by Wolfsburg. Huh, not ideal. Although Smith will be recovered by then. Oh no, 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 no. Wait, I didn't sell Montipo. Let me call him up from the second team. Can you tell me, is this heaven? or hell. No other keeper was available because their under 19s and second team played on the same day. So the only players available were lads from the local pub named Ramel and Rakowski. However, I have an idea. I know when I paid 77 million for you to prevent goals from going into my net, you didn't imagine that job requiring gloves, did you? Bro. <laughs> No expectations should be low, but even I would have saved that. <laughs> hey, who pulled that out? Now you'd think we'd be able to score at least one. But when Holthouse point blank shot gets tipped onto the bar and Wiper hits the post and added time, maybe it wasn't our day. Alright, who's next? Stuttgart? <laughs> Come right in, I got something to show you once again. Two additional victories followed, including three strikes from Nelson, leading to our round of 16 encounter versus PSV. It could have been more difficult, but then I remembered that Ajax tie in the Europa League and knew we had to be serious in Eidenhoven. I can't lie though, seeing an old Denzel Dumfries at center back raised my eyebrows. Only a true fraud would consider doing that. For ourselves, I began running this front four consistently because Holthouse was the opposite of that. Together, they were cooking in Germany, and to start this encounter, goals nearly happened. PSV got close too, but by the 15th minute, Nelson Wiper would not home the opener. Everything seemed good until... Oh no, what is that? Oh, we should be fine. What? Both center halves were at fault, leaving us frustrated at the half. Then, something odd happened. Alex Valle gets a lot of assists with his left foot, which makes sense. He has never scored with that foot, and he'd continue not to do so, because he curled it in with his weaker one. I would have loved a bigger advantage going into the second leg, but I should have been happy with what I had, because before I could realize and say the name Sergei Milinkovic Savic, PSV equalized. After a 5 year Saudi stay, he arrived on a free to PSV, aiding to a 2 all draw. A sufficient 2 0 win over Mainz occurred prior to the second leg, but we were eager to reach the quarters for the first time. 
A little luck was required as we draw Ogo's deflection led to Onyagule's opener. Despite an early onslaught, nothing else went in until close to the half. PSV had a corner, and the second ball led to a shot from Beltron, whose strike conveniently hits Andrelson's lifted foot at the perfect angle, equalizing the aggregate. Just like in the first leg though, we were first to pounce to go back ahead. A penalty won by Widra Ogo, slotted in by Wiper. An insurance goal wasn't required, as we narrowly moved on to the quarters. More triumphs brought comfort in the Bundesliga, with these three making it 7 on the trot. Widra Ogo rediscovering himself was especially sweet. I can't say the same with Holt House. Meanwhile, Dortmund and Leipzig were both dropping points. Beifeld Bay with a couple draws and a loss to Drunk Klopp, while Leipzig were inconsistent and also succumbed to Drunk Klopp. Bayern, meanwhile, lost some momentum after being eliminated in Europe by Napoli. Dortmund remained the closest challengers, but with an 8 point gap, the reality of our first Bundesliga crown was near. But if we fall into a bad run before the big two, I, I don't even want to think about that. So, on the 8th of April 2031, we faced a team that made us remember such a shameful night. Napoli were having a fantastic Serie A campaign, which saw them win the title. No thanks to the few guys mentioned earlier having ridiculous seasons. Luis Enrique was their current boss, but no matter who was in charge, Serie A almost became automatic with 5 titles in 6 years. Although, a few weeks prior to our encounter, they lost to Inter at home who used the secret plan. That was a little too much power to use from the get go, but to avoid a 5 star beatdown again, I pushed the cam out wide, replacing them with Hold House. Have I learned from my previous mistake? The stats didn't think so, with them having several shots before we could muster one. But when we did attack, disaster struck for them. In what looked like a routine grab by Moret, something wasn't right, as he needed treatment. That led to a substitution, because he tore his wrist ligaments. 18 year old Maurizio da Pice had to fill in. On one end, we had Elijah Smith making an insane save. On the other, Sarue, who accidentally put in Slip Jung, broke through and took the lead. A tactical error turns into a genius decision. To end the half, Fati had this point blank miss. Following another unfortunate moment for Napoli, as they replaced Van Hecke at right back with Soldani. It seems as if all their money was spent on the attack. Still, they made it struggle to get shots on net, so why not try from distance? Here we go, pass. Oh yes! Take advantage, shoot on sight. Let's do it. We should have made it three, but Holdhouse, now it advanced forward, missed this one on one. Bro, I've been training you to round the keeper for months. Nevertheless, two nil away seemed like it would be enough. A huge thanks to Smith, making Napoli's forwards look fraudulent. Before the second leg, we had to deal with Freiburg, which gave little chance to rotate as any drop points would be risky. Thankfully, a brace from Wiper allowed me to rest some guys later on. We were prepared to eliminate Napoli. Corner kick four. Our opponents and they score first. Not ideal to allow a goal this early. And they nearly did it again. Soon, we restored our advantage. Offside? How? He's running in front of him. I don't want to say more. Unfortunately, the sole shot on target from both sides was the only one scored. The next shot on target will be a goal too, with Valle barely touching Guanani, whose blatant dive gave Napoli a penalty, equaling the tie. A lot of our good players were having bad games, and while the opposition hadn't created much, they pushed it to extra time. With penalties on the horizon and many bodies tired, I took a risk and subbed on guys better from the spot, although Max Morstedt nearly got the winner at the end, separated by pens. We had our best going first, and they had an average 18 year old in net. Doku, top bits. Wiper, bottom corner. Fati, not being stopped. Morstedt, save. Okay, we, we can save this, we can save these, we can save these please. Yes, Smith. Duarcahea placed it well, and Bergval would also be stopped by Smith. Weedrago then gave us the edge, heading into the final round. Galich, who started this drama, tucked it home. Which means, if Jung scores, we move on. However, flashing back two years ago, his penalty miss versus Leipzig led to our elimination. Since then, thousands of pens have been practiced. All for this moment, where he slotted down the middle, so up a Champions League semi-final where we'd face Borussia Dortmund. 
Facing Bay Fal Bay three times within 10 days was all the talk. Never has the Ruhr Derby held so many stakes, but before the Bundesliga encounter, there was one more match day. We had Köln and Dortmund had Leverkusen. They would lose. Meaning, if we defeat Köln, our gap expands to 11 with 3 to go. Even a draw would make things great but clinching it at home and then focusing on the semis was the ideal scenario. Schalke haven't won Germany's first division since 1958, five years before the Bundesliga's inception. No top flight trophy since 2011, 20 years. And this drought can finally end. Kohler's solid, so I played a strong team. And of course, they scored first. A frustrating half, but maybe I was asking too much out of this 11. With over 30 to go, I got desperate and widened the formation. As a drunk man once said, I underwent a hair transplant. I think the results are pretty cool, don't you? What a story! <laughs> don't you. 69th minute, we score, but it's offside. 70th minute, Holthouse. That was the worst football performance I've seen in a very long time. 72nd minute, Bolek scores his first for the club. Nine points clear. Due to Holthouse's uselessness, I decided to remove his wide roll and replace him with Onyek Bule. The substitute got close. Before thinking of my next move, Cohn kept chucking along and sent a ball in behind De Brunner. The former Dormant player was about to ruin my night. But Smith kept him out. We were entering at a time. Win that, please. Ah, uh, wait, win that? Baye, good job, Ogawa. Onyek Bule. Oh, yeah, Bule! Oh my gosh! A 93rd minute goal! Onyek Bule! They're gonna get their wish any second now. There it is! Schalke are the champions! We have done it! Schalke are Bundesliga champions for the first time since 1950. Hey, oh my gosh, doing it so late, but we kept it till the end. We didn't have our best game, but we kept our focus till the very end. And we win the league three match days early. Let's go. I wish we could just celebrate this, but there's more to achieve. Before the Champions League semi-final, we rotated against Dortmund in the Bundesliga. And Matarazzo was surprisingly happy for me. Although, the look on his face as his side gave us a guard of honor at their stadium felt so good. Unfortunately, we lost this due to some late cheese, but they can have it. The real discussion was which one of us will make the final. On their way here, Dorman defeated Manchester City in the round of 16, 1-0, and then knocked down Real Madrid 5-2 on aggregate. They deserved their spot, and just like in the dress rehearsal, it was tight. Nobody wanted to make that mistake, but it also helped that they were missing their key man, Max Alstite. The first noteworthy moment arrived after the interval. Carrera running up the wing. Carrera running, running, and running. Whip into the back post. We draw goal! At the Westfalen Stadion, that was massive, and a huge advantage was in our sights. Yet, they were able to force a mistake from Jung and pounced. Walters found Adeyemi, who had a difficult job. But his delivery somehow got to Nementia. This guy again? Oh, what a frustrating goal to concede. That upper hand vanquished with all the play for at the Veltins Arena. Byron in between actually saw us defeat Drunk Klopp again, despite me only bringing on the starters after the 60th minute. Byron lost. <laughs> Klopp laughed it off, but their board did not look impressed. I will a small issue was that Wiper wasn't fully fit for the second leg due to a light shin injury. I also went full and played Emre Salman in this match. Dropping Widra Ogo was controversial, but what might surprise you is Hincapié starting. He eventually cemented that role with Kovacevic, and the Ecuadorian's early block was reassuring. With little going on, both sides couldn't be separated, but that changed in the last 15 as they scored. Oh, Heartbreak avoided, but that feeling could still happen. Nothing of note occurred in the extra periods, until we zoomed to the final seconds. Back to Valle. Off the post! Wiper. Oh man! Three of the previous four champions of Germany wouldn't be separated, so penalties was the only way. Separates us from the Champions League final, and Chesko misses first. Now Wiper's stepping up, and he slots it in. He is dead tired, though. We got the advantage. 
And Palacios misses! Yes! Smith with two saves already in the shootout. And we can already go 2-0 up. The Brazilian, Correa. Bang! Konate now. He slots it in. We throw a go. Not had a good game off the bench. But he can make it 3-0. He misses the net. He misses the net completely. Chan Bozdogan now. He hits the post. What is happening in this shootout? Who's next? Who's next? Jung. Oh, can he do it again? Can Jung send us to the Champions League final? He does! This season has gone my way. However, we set up this team well, and I don't have a position where I have to worry. The last match day saw Augsburg defeated and sent to the second division, confirming us with 83 points. A huge thanks to our top scorer, Nelson Wiper, finally showing his potential with 22 goals. Elijah Smith was brilliant, grabbing the most clean sheets while conceding a mere 15. The Spanish fullbacks were huge, grabbing 8 assists each, plus the midfield depth carried the load when others were injured or underperforming. Ogawa and Sarure included, who both got into the Bundesliga team of the season. Then Duarte Heia, who ended the campaign on 12 goals and 13 assists, handing him the Bundesliga player of this Jamal see all I wanted? Finally, there's me receiving the trainer of the season. We definitely overperformed, but we could further cement our legacy with Schalke and win their first Champions League. The opponents were PSG. All roads lead to them. Seriously, they've won the previous three finals. By tight margins, yes, but they know how to do it. On their way here, they got by Lyon, Porto, and AC Milan. Ligue 1? Yes, Never sir. lost it. Coupe de France? Yes, won a majority. Sir. Who's managing? Mikel Arteta. The team had guys you would know from eight years ago. Donnarumma in net, Hakimi at right back, Nuno Mensch on the left, an imposing midfield of Ugarte, Vitinha, and Xavi Simmons, and Colomuani up front. Some changes included Kim and Jay and an Italian named Nicolo Rocca at the back. On the wings, they had options like Ferran Torres, Sheldarup, Usmani Dembele, and Jaden Sancho. Of course, how can I not mention the legend Kylian Mbappe. Although, only an icon according to PSG fans. As always, stopping him was going to be a challenge. Especially with no right back. Walde was injured weeks ago, but days before the match, Sergio Carrera pulled his knee ligaments. I did buy a guy from Anderlecht in the winter, but I loaned him for some reason. I had no natural options available. Although, Pelletier did play there against Augsburg for a little, and actually got an assist. Not ideal, but it's him or Academy Boy, I'll scoot. Breaking news, just in. Kylian Mbappe will miss out on the Champions League final with an injury. Uh, this apparently occurred four days ago. No Kylian Mbappe. There also wouldn't be Gonzalo Ramos and Kim Min Jae. That left the Parisians scrambling, leading to Nuno Mensch starting in central defense. Still, they're strong and we had issues too but I wouldn't want it any other way. On a warm evening in Amsterdam, where we wore our white away kit, the match got started. However, off a corner kick, Nuno Mensch plays it short, receives it back, and finds Simmons. With a little bit of dribbling, he returns it to Mensch, who escapes Wiper for the opener. It's annoying, but there's a lot of time. We were aggressive in the middle, and got ourselves storming up the pitch. Not long after their goal, Duarte Cahaya was found, dribbling past Akimi to equalize. You can't take us lightly, PSG. And that goal exposed them. We began creating decent opportunities, and they kept making mistakes. Rosa down on the ground, currently injured, but we have a chance. Threatening in their box. We draw a goal! 2 1, Schalke! Well, we went it back. No. Big save by Smith. But he was offside. It's all good, all good. A 2 1 lead at half was unexpected, and PSG had to react. They brought up Ugarte and their left back Christensen for Bidstrup and 37 year old Marquinhos. This was going to be his last match as a professional, and it's unfortunate that he got wrapped up with his Brazilian compatriot. Ooh, blocked. Let's see. Can we do something? What a dribble. Back post. Yes! Wiper makes it three! Oh my days! What a mistake by Dollaruma! What a move by Kahea! Are we actually doing this? Two thirds through the encounter, and we hadn't seen much from them. However, if you give quality players even a breath, they will make you pay. And that was how PSG 
got within one. They're a team of winners. Even without their main man, you still maintain that aura when you've won three in a row. I didn't have much to respond with. Although, Holdhouse came on as a pacey option up top. Meanwhile, PSG's only other option at that role was Xavi Simmons. From there, time went on and we shifted to our three defensive midfield formation with Ogawa subbed on to secure our lead. The end was near, all PSG could do was foul, and the final whistle went. Yes, we've won the Champions League! Let's go! Oh my gosh, we've done it! We've done it! We've won the Champions League! Oh my days! <laughs> yes! We've beaten the three-time champs! Whoa, oh my gosh, I can't believe this! Taken from 16th place in the 2nd division, to now Bundesliga and Champions League winners in our 8th season. It was a topsy-turvy ride, with some fun highs and really low lows. While the journey was at times frustrating, I do want to thank you all for watching and showing support for this series or any of the ones in the past. I hope you enjoyed the finale of .fm. Thank you to my Patrons, who you can see on the screen right now. That includes Chimichanga411, Dex, Indigolite735, and RGJR01. For $1 a month, you can get your name in the credits of my future uploads, and who knows, maybe your name will be said next time. Please at least consider looking at the Patreon, as I also have more. That includes a $5 tier, where you can take this Schalke adventure and continue it. Nevertheless, I appreciate the support. And I hope all of you rest easy.